Hey everybody, I hope you're having a great new year. What you're hearing here is the sound of my new heater, which is putting out some nice good heat out of this vent right here, which is over by my workbench. And here's the control panel for that. Behind this wall is a custom mini furnace that I built out of one of those Chinese diesel heaters. So stay tuned to see how I built this thing. And here's a shot from inside the workshop where the actual mini furnace is. And if you haven't noticed already, it's built out of a two drawer file cabinet that's flipped on its end here. And let me just show you real quickly how it works. Well, the core of this furnace is this diesel heater. It's one of those Vivor diesel heaters. And it's the, I think it's the eight kilowatt. And it's the one that's not in a cased package. It's all separate so that I had more options to mount the tank where I want and, and do the housing the way I want. Let me just explain how I did it and I'll start from the fuel side. Now this won't be an exhaustive how-to on how to build one of these things. It does require a bit of knowledge about various different things. This tank came with a kit. As you can see, I've just kind of screwed it into the wall here. I put a little piece of uh, OSB sheathing, screwed it in there, and it's above the heater. Now, I would recommend if you're building one of these things to put the tank higher than the heater and that way gravity from the fuel line can draw it into the pump and the pump does not have to work as hard and may last longer. And yes, I've seen implementations of these heaters where the tank was under the heater. That still works for the most part, but the pump will last longer and it's not exactly you know, highest quality stuff. So it is better to have it above. That's why I wanted to keep it separate in here. Also, it makes it real easy to refill because it's just right here. Now, when you get these tanks, one thing that's also difficult about this, like for example, the tank here, is the output fitting that they'll give you this little fuel nipple to put inside the can, but you actually have to drill your own hole, feed your wire up, get your fuel nipple worked into this hole and get your gaskets put on. And there's no instructions for that. Don't expect installation instructions. There's a diagram of these things and that's about it. So this is advanced DIY stuff. So you, hopefully you know a little bit about small engines and, and little fuel line things like that because the instructions won't help you at all. So as you can see, I have the fuel line coming out the bottom in through a rubber grommet through the metal casing going down into a fuel filter that's attached to the sidewall there. If I ever want to replace it, I can easily get in here and replace that. The line comes into the pump. Again, very easy to replace this if I ever need to. And then from there, the line goes down through the bottom of the case and the fuel line goes into the nipple that's in the bottom of the unit for the fuel input. Okay, next let's talk about the electrical. If you're not familiar with these units, they're not really designed for garages or cabins, but a lot of people have used them for that. They're really designed for 12 volt applications because the input on this is 12 volts. So they're really designed more for RVs and boats and things like that. I had to have a 12 volt power supply. And what I ended up doing is I have in my stash of parts this IOTA DLS 55, which is a 55 amp output, 120 volt to 13 and a half, basically a 12 volt power converter. Well, it's a bit overkill because all you really need for this device is 15 amps. So I'll have a link in the description to a similar power supply that's a little bit smaller than that one. That's about $25 on Amazon for about a 30 amp output. But I happen to have this one, didn't have another use for it. So might as well make use of it. So then I have the input coupled into here and that's the 12 volt in. So the input for the power supply itself is simply a 110 volt AC outlet that I had wired up here. So as you can see, I ran a whip into that box inside of the unit. It goes into a switch and I wanted to keep this Again, none of this is detailed out in the instructions, but I decided I wanted to make this more like a furnace as far as for code. So I put a switch on it for a shutoff, and then that is tapped into a 15 amp outlet up here. 
All, that's how all the electrical works. So you have the 120 volt power supply converting it down to 13 and a half, approximately 12 volts, and that powers the unit. So it's all in one package here, just like a furnace. So for the little furnace cabinet itself, obviously, like I mentioned, this is a two drawer file cabinet that's turned on its side. And these typically don't have a bottom to them. I bought this, by the way, I bought this at the thrift shop for like $12. You could probably find one of these in your house or get one for free. So it makes a great casing and it's plenty spacious for me to do maintenance. These typically don't come with a bottom to them. This side here would, be, would have been the bottom. So what I did was I took out one of the drawers and cut the steel out of it and I just welded it on and made that the side or the bottom of the cabinet. I made cutouts. As you can see, I made a cutout for the main output hose. And what I did here was I took some of the extra fuel line that they gave me and I slid it in half and I basically glued it all around that hole to make a nice little grommet so that I don't actually cut my hose open. That goes in through the wall there and into the vent cap that comes with the unit. And there it is. I have it kind of, uh, set low so that the air, the heat comes out kind of low and cocked kind of to the side so the heat comes out low and into the middle and I thought that would be perfect. I also ran a wire, the main wire and harness out of that grommet down there and up the wall and into the back here which is where the control panel lives and this is how you can turn it on and set the temperature and settings. As far as the front cover, I just took the drawer faces, I just crappily welded them together, and then I put four magnets that I happen to already have, those little magnet catches, and that makes for a little front door for it. And then I cut a hole in here. Now this kind of looks like one of those four inch dryer exhausts, but it's actually not. This, these, this is just an open louver, and it's made for an intake. So that's perfect, and I set it right behind the air intake for the unit. Now on the bottom, as you can see, that's where the business end is. I took the steel plate that they, the mounting plate that they gave me, and I simply cut out an opening in the bottom of the cabinet here, and then that's where all of the uh, combustion pieces come out of. And as you can see, I have the, the combustion air intake just kind of in right here and held in with a clamp. I have the fuel line coming in here with a little bit of protective stuff on that so it doesn't melt it. And of course the exhaust. Now the other piece that I had to buy is this flange. Now notice that I have this three inch flange coming out of the wall here and I'll show you the exterior side of that. Those flanges are actually built for boats and RVs to protect the siding of the boat or the RV from the high heat that comes out of that exhaust tube. So it basically insulates it so that whatever surface it's touching does not get hot. Now keep in mind, if you're doing it in a boat or RV, you're talking about screwing that flange into fiberglass or a vinyl clad motorhome exterior. And so it is set up to handle the heat such that it doesn't melt those materials. And it works also perfectly for my uses going through the wood. Now I put a lot of emphasis on making sure the exhaust is safe because I don't want to cause any kind of gas leak. So I made extra sure that this flange was done properly. So not only did I spend the money on the flange, but I also um, cut, because one of the problems I've seen is with introduction of moisture into the exhaust. And one reason for that is I noticed one guy who I saw in a video put it on his siding. Well, siding is lapped and it, it comes out at an angle like this, right? So that could invite moisture to fall down into the, to the opening there. So I made sure I, that I cut out the siding and I put a piece that's flat up against the sheathing of the house. And then I put some flashing on it, caulked it all in, and that's where I mounted that thing so that this thing is nice and plumb and shouldn't have water intrusion. I also made sure that it was enough off the ground. It's well over 24 inches and maybe even 25 or 26 inches off the ground, which means I shouldn't have any issues with snow. Yes, it looks a little bit ugly right now, but uh, in the spring when I paint that up to the, the body color, you won't even see that hardly.
So a bit of more advice on the exhaust because that's the most important thing. What I would suggest is if you see that I have some of that blue stuff on there, I use some Megalock dope on the actual pipe fitting and the clamp they have. I'll probably upgrade that cheap hose clamp on there, but what that pipe sealant dope does in there is if there is minor imperfections in that clamping, it will kind of fill in those gaps. So I put that on there and on the exhaust side where it clamps onto the flange as well. The other thing I would recommend, and again, this isn't really called out really well in the instructions, I think they mention it though, is to make sure your exhaust is tilted down when it's going out. These are not made for water intrusion like a gas furnace that's in your house where it has a condensate handler. So you do not want to get water in this. So what I ended up doing is bending this around and then up as high as I can go and then back down. So that way, if water does get in from the outside, it won't get into the furnace. It'll drain back down. That is a quick summary of the implementation here. I, again, I'm not doing really a DIY how-to since this is so custom, but that's how I implemented it. And so far it's been working well. Let me go ahead and show you it running. So running this thing, it couldn't be easier. I just need to make sure that my kill switch is on for my furnace and that will enable the power supply. Then I just walk around here and all I have to do is turn on the unit. It'll even talk to me. I don't bother setting the clock or anything because that gets reset when I turn it off. But I think I have it set on like, you know, what, 62 degrees. Give it a couple minutes. You'll hear it kind of priming itself. When you first run these things, I, it takes about 10 minutes before you get heat out of it. But according to the instructions, it's all automatic. It, it does its priming and everything that's all automatic and that's normal operation. It doesn't take as long subsequently, but it does take a minute or two to get started and then you'll start hearing it ramp up and start burning. And after two to three minutes, it finally is ramping up and providing some heat. You can see this is how loud it is. Fuel pump's probably the loudest thing that makes that ticking sound, but it's not too bad. And there's a little thermostat here. So that's the setup right there. I've run this for a few hours yesterday and will it heat this entire large garage that has a 12 foot ceiling? No, it will not. But when I'm down around here, you know, working on the desk or this area here, it definitely does make it nice and warm right here. And I also have a little oil heater over here as well that plugs into the electric. It does come with a remote, so I can operate this from the other side of the garage here. But the main goal of this isn't to heat this garage up to a room temperature. It's really just to take the chill out of the air in certain areas so that it's a little bit more bearable to work in. So if it can just heat up the garage by five or 10 degrees, that would be great. Now the reason I went with this diesel heater and made that little furnace out of it was because I really don't have the electrical to supply one of those, you know, you've seen those ceiling hanging 240 volt electric heaters. I do have 240 volts, but I only have a circuit that is able to run my compressor and my car charger. I don't have enough amperage on this little 60 amp panel to dedicate 30 amps at 240 to a electric heater. I also don't really like those propane heaters. They require you to have the garage open a little bit. They require ventilation basically. This one has exhaust ventilation and there should be no fumes inside here. So that's kind of why I went with that. And as far as parts and pricing, well, the heater unit itself, which came with the gas tank and all that stuff you saw in there, except for the power supply, that was $100. I would say the file cabinet and this little 
piece that I bought at the resale shop together was a whopping $15. You could probably get these file cabinets for free most places. The power supply was free, but like I said, that's $25 if you buy one on Amazon. You know, I had to buy, you know, some electrical cable and some other fittings. A lot of that stuff I already had, but let's call that another $20 for the electrical stuff. And then about $20 for that exhaust flange that, that does not come with the unit. And I'll provide Amazon links to all those products. So depending on what you already have in your home, this may be between a $150 and $200 setup. And for the amount of heat you get out of it, I think it's well worth that $200. So anyway, that is the video. I hope you liked my little setup here and maybe it inspired you for how you can solution heating options for your garage or workshop. Thanks for watching. Take care.